You're listening to We Deepen Media. Have you heard? The We Deepen Podcast Network has a new show. The Elevate to Legendary podcast by Dr. Nikki is a journey to activate your fullest self-expression. Dr. Nikki interviews leaders who have transcended perceived limitations in order to make a meaningful impact. Guests share their stories to teach you how to optimize your body, brain, and spiritual connection to manifest a truly fantastic life. Be sure to search for Elevate to Legendary with Dr. Nikki in your podcast app or go to wedeepen.com backslash podcasts to subscribe now and listen later. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Deepen with Christina. I'm your host, Christina Weber, founder of We Deepen and Feminine Weapon, and also a certified professional coach supporting experienced designers and those on a journey of self and social discovery. This podcast follows my entrepreneur journey and shines light on the human connection industry. In the last episode, I shared a journey through my psyche in a solo podcast episode. It felt vulnerable. It wasn't my first time doing a solo podcast, but it definitely felt as though it was. I spoke about how I was questioning my relationship with social media and dreaming about living a life without a cell phone. In today's episode, you meet my friend, Roman Wyden, who disappeared off of Facebook and Instagram about a year and a half ago. I wanted to hear about his experiences. Before getting into it with him, I'm going to share what's happening with We Deepen and my love life. First, we've added a few festivals and events to the calendar at wedeepen.com backslash calendar. High Vibe Fest happens May 6th through the 8th in Nevada City, California. It's a two-night conscious camping festival celebrating good music, organic food, workshops, yoga, healing, fun, and good vibes with many of my favorite people, including new couple Equanimous and Ruby Chase. Go be in the love at High Vibe Fest. Bhakti Fest, Bhakti Love Fest is September 15th through the 18th in Lake Lizabella, just two and a half hours outside of Los Angeles. It's three days of kirtans, yoga, chanting, ecstatic dance, produced by One Love Fest. Unleash is returning September 23rd through the 25th in a new location in Austin, Texas. It's a substance-free, three-day guided transformational dance journey designed as a catalyst to activate your fullest self-expression and creative power, releasing limiting blocks that have prevented you from being your truest self-expression. Now, this experience is personal for me because as maybe you've heard, The Last Unleash is where I met the new love of my life, Javier, and there have been many couples. Uh, Yadi and I actually just sent a, a baby shower present to a couple who met at Unleash in Los Angeles in the beginning of, of 2020. So lots of love happening there, lots of epiphanies, lots of connections. Definitely make sure to join me at Unleash. If you haven't checked it out, you have to get to Unleash. And then Tantra Speed Dates. There's many Tantra Speed Dates on the calendar in Los Angeles, San Francisco, San Diego, New York City, Boston, London. If you are currently single or in an open relationship, go check out Tantra Speed Date. It's a beautiful in-person experience. Use the promo code WEDEEPEN. We set that up for you for network pricing. So use the code, go to the calendar, wedeepen.com backslash calendar. I am leaving for Puerto Rico this coming week. Javier and I are heading down there uh, for two weeks to explore a new project that he may be taking on. Javier is a builder, construction worker. Uh, He's built agri-retreats there in Miami. So he's going to go check out land for a friend and see how he can support them in building building a, a retreat center, some Airbnbs there. While in Puerto Rico, I am going to be recording a podcast on 
dark retreats. I became fascinated by the idea of dark retreats after listening to Aubrey Marcus. Uh, he spoke about his experiences. He did a documentary on it. After watching the documentary, I was so curious, do women do this? I wanted to hear about a woman's experience. So I found Nicole from Ancient Futures, and we are going to be recording a podcast. I'm going to dive into her experience. She spent, I think, 26 days in complete darkness. And once you're there for three days, it actually, it releases DMT in the brain, which is many of many people go to ayahuasca ceremonies or just use straight DMT to get that level of power. But your body accesses DMT naturally when you're in darkness for two or three more days. So I'm going to dive into that. And then after Puerto Rico, Javier and I are going to fly to Maryland. He's going to meet my family. We're going to pack up my car. And then I'm going to make my way to Miami. I'm relocating to Miami for love. I've always said I would move for love. Oh, vulnerably sharing this with you. You're getting to see a real love lived. Okay, so on to today's conversation. You are going to meet my friend Ramon Wyden. He is an award-winning writer, director, podcast host. He's dedicated his life to the exploration of intimacy, playfulness, authenticity, and modern-day relationships. Growing up in Switzerland, he took on various forms of art to soothe his struggle with understanding the true meaning of love. The exploration took him from being a DJ to doing musical performances on stage, acting, film, TV, and eventually finding his voice as an artist at the highly acclaimed Pasadena Art Center. His two podcasts, ADHD is Over and You Love Your Life, have received rave reviews and inspired deeper human connection for families and lovers. Ramon is currently working with couples through his private relationship coaching practice to help them overcome disconnection and align further. Let's get into it. Hello, everybody. So I am inviting you into a conversation with my friend, Roman. And I reached out to Roman after, gosh, we haven't talked in maybe two, two years And the last interaction that we had was on social media. And I remember you exiting social media, which as the last episode of Deep In with Christina was focused on me as a solo show of me sharing about how I was craving transitioning my relationship outside of social media. So I was so curious because I went back to your profile to see if you were there and Mm -hmm. you weren't. (laughs) And I sent you this text message to see how life has been a year and a half after you leaving Facebook. And I imagine that there is the other social media platforms too, if you were on them that, that you left. So I'm excited to dive into the conversation to see how I may survive without social media. That's awesome. Well, thank you for having me. Uh, Like I said before, I believe if I were to sum it up and I only had 30 seconds to describe what happened in my life as a result of getting off of social media, it's that once I got off social media, I had to deepen. So my saying would be, if we can get off social media, we can deepen, right? To sort of pun intended with your movement and your uh, what you're working on. Um, I would say I call it digital suicide. (laughs) It's a strong word, but I, it's almost like I had been cutting myself for, you know, I'd been trying to get off, trying to, uh, get, because it was painful after a while, it became really, uh, a dark shadow. And so I, I sort of used that metaphor because at some point it felt like, oh my God, am I about to like kill my online personality and therefore kill part of myself? Mm -hmm. Um, And in short, it is, that is what it felt like. I remember my wife and I were doing it at the same time. We were downloading the um, content, both Facebook and Instagram before you delete it, you download all the content, you get all the photos, all the posts, everything gets downloaded. Uh, 
Oh, you can do that? Yes, yes. Absolutely. Oh, I didn't know. That's the one thing that I'm so concerned with. If I delete it, I I yeah. like to at times to go back and remind myself of who I am Absolutely. by looking through my Facebook. So I assure you, you can do that. You get and I, and it was very quick. And I was like, well, that can't be possible. Like it's years of photos and posts. But then I went into the folder, and sure enough, it was from what I could tell all there. So so we did it at the same time, and it literally felt like. You know, when you, uh, I've never actually bungee jumped, but you know, when you do anything exhilarating, like when I first did a zip line, had my first zip line experience, there's that moment of like, I, I think this is going to be safe and I'm just going to have to just let go. And the moment you let go, there's that like <gasps> moment and then you're fine. And that's all it was. It was like hitting delete was such a relief after one second. Because nothing happened. It's not like the skies were falling down and suddenly, oh my God, I'm cut off from the world and I can't breathe and I don't know what's going on. None of that. It was just like, oh, that was easy. So that was step one, right? Mm -hmm. um, and here's what's interesting. I had thought about many times and like, what is social media? Like, wh why are we on this thing or these platforms? And I kind of broke it down very simply. I call it the what. Like, you know, what does it do? Well, it's a bullhorn. So you can create your online personality and share your thoughts, right? Mm -hmm. You can stay in touch with friends and family. Mm -hmm. And you can advertise your business or product. And the product could be yourself as a brand, right? Mm -hmm. So I think those are the main ones in terms of a bullhorn, like a, an out, right? What you throw out there. And then the why, what we get from it, the results is really, first of all, let's be honest, we get approval on our photos or personality or whatever on our experiences and validation. That's the main driver. Then you also have the convenience of not having to contact every single friend and family member once you went on vacation and you have great photos, right? Then also you can meet new friends, of course. You can generate business or business leads. And for a lot of people, you can say that's good or bad, but people get their news sources from there, right? And then, of course, there's the inspirational quotes, uh, but I call that still news. You're like looking for something that's happened or that someone is saying to take it in, right? So to me, those are the main reasons. And I realized that it is actually very possible to do all of that, to get all those results in real life, not just on, you know, on social media platforms. And it started with me really realizing like, oh, well, now I have to call my friends if I want to talk to them. I have to actually think about who do I care to share news with, right? And for business, I had to meet people face to face. And instead of just creating some senseless product, I'm not knocking anyone who does that, but I, I can't do that anymore. For me to just create a senseless product to just sell a million units through social media so I can make money and pay my bills, you know, that's not something I'm interested in. It's possible on social media, but uh, having a more meaningful path in life and actually uh, creating a service and advertising something that makes a difference for people, that's usually best done work to mouth, like one-on-one, -on -one, right? And so that's what I did with my businesses. And meeting new friends for me is, I mean, I'm a type A person. I can meet friends anywhere. I don't have to do this online. And uh, the news, I certainly used to get some news sources from uh, uh, social media platforms. But now I just research. Somebody will tell me something or I'll hear it somewhere. I don't watch the news myself either. I don't have television. So what needs to find me finds me. And I've come to terms with that that is actually true. And, and here's, here's why, is because my life has drastically improved. The happiness and my content, my fulfillment in life has drastically improved. So therefore, not getting all the stuff I used to get on social media has now proven to be not only a good thing for me mentally and spiritually, but I'm not missing out on anything, literally. Mm, I really appreciate that list that you're sharing. And, you know, if, if, if to, to also go through it through my lens, first, the, the one on the approval and validation, I mean, 
that the how fulfilling that is for one through social media is very much superficial to some extent because number one it, you have to rely on like i've i've gone through having these like feel like these genius thoughts in my head and i'll go to social media and i'll share them and there's the times where it's like crickets i get right. no response the the algorithm didn't show it to anybody or maybe it did and maybe no one gave a shit so the yeah. level of of validation and approval isn't necessarily as impactful as it is when I'm out in the real world. And then another point that you made around meeting people. Uh, yes, I have definitely met friends through social media. I actually even met one person that I dated through Facebook once. Uh, however, similar to dating apps, the greatest fulfilling relationships that people have are of, of people who they meet in real life. You know, we all love to have the story of how we met somebody um, and that, the, the, that depth. And, and for sure, if there's a novelty sometimes maybe in the beginning of that you met somebody through social media or that you met somebody on a dating app. But the more that you do it, the less novelty there is to it as well. So those stories of when you actually, you know, a lot of us are, you know, have some type of awkward social experiences at times. Yeah. And, you know, when you are primarily using technology to connect with other humans, you lose the practice that being out in the real world and having to make eye contact with someone, having to start a conversation, having to say hi, those skills began to d diminish because they're not practice. Right. And, and it's also a really good time if you do want to meet people in real life. Like it's a really good time to do that because people are like, oh my gosh, I was out and they said hi to me at the grocery store. Yes, yes. And I love that, you know, and as I'm raising two boys, 10 and 13, I'm trying really hard to uh, balance their screen time with real life, you know, interactions, because you're right, it's like a muscle. It's not a morally wrong thing. You know, when people say, oh, well, we're not used to, you know, we're always on screens, and we can't really relate to people in real life. They look at it as like they're being punished for for being that. So I'm not saying that it's not a moral, like it's like a no, no. But it is a reality, like you said, it's a muscle. And if we don't use it, then when you see people being awkward in public, uh, could be for other reasons too, right? If someone's depressed or dealing with mental illness, I get it. But generally, when we're awkward with people in public, it's because, like you said, we're not used to fostering those moments, like meeting someone, looking them in the eyes, being comfortable with a moment of silence, right? It's not awkward when somebody says hi and you look at them for two more seconds and smile and then walk away. That's so rare nowadays. Whenever someone does that now in public, I'm literally like stunted. I'm like, whoa, it's like a zap. It's mm -hmm. like this person actually gave me the time of day to be present. And on social media, we, we think that's what it is when someone's present with us on social media or they're liking us, they follow us. But it is a persona, it is a facade that we create because who's going to post reality all the time? No one. We're, we're Photoshopping our pictures. We're making our vacations sound better than they were. You know, we're depressed, but we're posting inspiring quotes. Now, nothing wrong with that. That's part of getting out of depression, right? Or depressive moments, but it's just, we don't see the reality. And when we're in person with someone and we get to know them better, there is, I think for the most part, people are hopefully honest, right? Um, there is a better sense of reality. And then we can, we feel better about ourselves too. That was a big one for me, by the way. Um, I would get really riled up during COVID, uh, elections and COVID, right? That was sort of my, my high point of like, see ya. And what I realized is that I do need a platform to speak to voice uh, my thoughts. And I found that actually, I use an app called Wisdom, uh, it's an audio, it's a social audio app. So I, uh, don't really interact with people. I just use it as a digital journal, an audio journal. 
I go on, I pick a topic and I start ranting and it records it so I can download it. So I have a record of it um, and people can join in as a conversation. But most of the time, I just want to get something off my chest, right? Because I needed, I, I realized I needed to do that. I can't just get off of social media and never, like you said, the need to share an amazing thought or a, a, right, a passionate moment in your life where you're like, I believe this about COVID. It's free speech. Well, sort of free, right, still. So I needed that. I was clear about that. And thank God I found wisdom. Uh, I was invited as an early adapter or what do you call them, a beta tester. Mm-hmm. So I've been on for quite a while. And it's it's a delightful app. And it's all it's usually coaches, people who are, want to make a difference in the world. So you're connecting with conscious individuals. So that helps too. It's not just a clubhouse where anything goes. Um so that so that's how I keep that part satisfied. Um, and then you also have a podcast, I imagine. Do you have two podcasts? Yeah, I have two podcasts. One is You Love Life that I've that's been a bit on the back burner, and uh, that was exploring intimacy, love, romance, sex. Um, where I've interviewed over 120 experts on the topic. Uh, now I've switched over to ADHD. That one's called ADHD is Over, and I've been diving deep into uh, what I'm early on believed ADHD wasn't or what it, what I now know in my belief it is. And so same thing. I interview experts. I have rants about topics and it's very related to what we're talking about because our children are growing up in this digital world of distractions. Um, And again, you could listen to it and go like, Oh yeah, it's another speaker talking about distractions and television and video games. I get it. But really, they're distractions away from what? Well, from dealing with real life, right? And as children become teenagers, later adults, if we don't give them an opportunity to actually address and process and sort of, let's call it deal or heal their issues, then they're going to just keep distracting themselves like I did as a young man. And then I never seemed present. I never seemed happy. I never seemed content. And so I was restless. I was distracted. Typical ADHD type of symptoms. And so I'm not saying media or or social media or video games or media in general are responsible for causing these behaviors in children, but they don't help. It's a distraction. It's a further distraction from being present. And I also realized that my own sort of I call them ADHD type behaviors because I don't believe they're symptoms. Symptoms just a label for behaviors. I also don't believe it's a disorder. It's just a nervous system that's stuck in the defense mode. Um, and so what I did is I, I just observed myself becoming more calm, more present, more loving. All of that was suddenly happening as these distractions were falling away, away like social media was one of them. During COVID, you know, we were locked down. We had to stay home although it wasn't an official lockdown, but it was suggested to stay home. And I realized I had to face all the things in my life that I sort of just distracted myself from facing. I was just busy. That's why they call it busyness, right? I was in business. I was like, go, 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 go. And suddenly it was like, slow down. What needs attention? And that really changed my life. And right then I got off of social media. So it was crickets, you know, not watching the news, not watching TV, not having social media, being home, not being able to meet people in person. It was at times excruciating. It was really like a detox, like a rehab, you know? Mm. So I once from, I guess, 37 to 38, I had made a a, a decision that I wouldn't drink alcohol for 365 days. Hmm, cool. It went longer uh, because once I had made it through 365 days, it wasn't that I got to like yeah. that day and like, let's go for drinks. It took me a, a few months afterwards and it shifted my entire relationship with alcohol. Hmm. That is, you know, one vice that, at where I grew up, you know, at, at 16, 17, 18, it was like, here's a, a beer, let's go party. Yep. And then you go to college and it's the same thing. And you're doing beer bongs and playing flip cup. 
And then I moved to New York City. And New York City is very much a restaurant and bar town. That's what you do also from a business perspective. And here I was years later coaching people on dating and love and also navigating my own personal love life and living in Los Angeles, which is one of the capitals of rehab. So there's so many people navigating love and dating in Los Angeles that, um, you know, don't drink and there's still a stigma around it. And this is before the craze of sober par- sober parties. I mean, now at WeDeepen.com, it's rare that any of the experiences that are listed there serve alcohol. Uh, mm. But at this time, you know, it was where do people go to have their first date? They're going to drink. And, um, and here is this most important aspect of being a human being, the, the quality of your life is determined by the quality of your relationships, and we're greasing the experience with alcohol. And yep. I remember being in the first, you know, 30, because I, I had stopped, you know, and prior to that experience, I had every year for probably the five years before, I had gone through some type of like 30 days, no alcohol cleanse experience. Right. Um, But I never, after the 30 days, I was just like, yes, let's go have a drink. Let's have a glass. I love red wine. (laughs) Uh, And, and so it was really that 90 day mark that I got through that I've stopped um, really craving alcohol completely. So now with me in um, wanting to shift my relationship with social media, I realized that, you know, from my my work in the relationship, uh, you know, working in the relationship business and and connecting and building community, um, there's so many, there, not so many, there's a few groups like the Esther Perel discussion group that I want to be able to connect with. So I, in this first week, I deleted the Facebook app from my phone. Yeah, that's I deleted, step one. I deleted Instagram from my phone. Nice. However, I like to share about the podcast episode. So I decided that twice a week, I would re-download Instagram to share uh, the audiograms and then I'd get off and I'd stop myself from in the stories because in the stories, you know, the story populates and then you're like, how many views, how many people saw it? Right. And so you're checking those numbers because uh, I realized, you know, you get more engagement uh, from stories than I would from post. Uh, and so I stopped myself from having to go back and see what the number statistically was and just put it out there. And then, you know, there was no scrolling to it. But there were there have been moments over the past week that, you know, where I was laying in bed and it would be a time where I would generally scroll through, you know, start scrolling. Or sometimes I'm on a phone conversation and mm-hmm. those times during the phone conversation, you'd be scrolling. And I noticed at times I would want to pull for my phone. I get this sense of like agitation of wanting it back. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, and so, and I haven't just completely deleted. I don't know if that's my full on journey. However, I have a, a dream that in a f- future years that I will go a year without a phone completely. <laughs> nice. Yeah. So this is this is a work working up to it. So what I'd love to to hear from you is when after you deleted the app, what was the ex- did you did you did you ever want to go back? Did you ever miss it? Were you ever irritated because you didn't have it anymore? Yeah, it's well, it's all of it, right? And I will say, you just reminded me, I will say that, um, you know, you start small. I remember I had like a few months without the apps on my phone. And then I would do a few months without posting anything. And then once I think I tried almost a year and I wrote an article about it on Medium and I I was already seeing results and happiness increase. So I kind of did it in stages, right? And yeah, first I took the apps off the phone because then if I was at the DMV or somewhere in line, I was like, what do I do? Like, I don't have Facebook and Instagram, right? So, of course, there's still a few apps I use, and I do believe they're also social media, which is LinkedIn, uh, YouTube, 
right? Because you do interact and you do posts and you get feedback. But I use YouTube pretty much like I would use a television. Like I'll watch some soccer. I'll watch an inspirational thing. I don't really comment. Uh, I don't currently add uh, content myself. And then LinkedIn is really just for business. And I've never actually gotten a single job uh, from LinkedIn. Uh, but I do have some connections there that I stay in touch with. I never use their post, uh, you know, their, uh, what do you call that? The, their own feature, their social media interactive feature. Um, and then I use Wisdom, which is a social audio app. But it's, again, uh, I never look at how many people are in my room. I never look at who's there. I just talk. So I don't interact with people. I don't, you know, I follow them and they follow me. But it's not, you don't post stories. You don't get feedback, any of that. So I think it's really, in short, it's really about finding a new universe, creating a new universe for you that serves your business, that serves your, your intent, your passion, connecting with people, selling, whatever it is, finding maybe different apps or doing things more in person or, uh, through email or uh, that sounds antiquated, but just finding a way that organically works for you. And then the, the result, I mean, the, the, the payoff really is that you're happier. You're less, you know, I call it, you, you, you're less depressed because social media is depressing. Not for everyone, not all the time, but it quickly can get depressing if you don't have a like, if you post something you've worked on for a, a year and people are like, yeah, cool. Or nobody responds because the, the AI is not showing it to people, right? It can be very... I use the word depressing because it leads to depression, right? I mean, there's scientific proof now with girls, especially, or young, young people, uh, feeling more depressed due to social media interactions and the bullying and the suicide and all that stuff. It's real. It's happening. So again, it's not that social media as an idea is bad. It's that if we're not using it to feel better, then we got to reevaluate it. If we're, if we're not feeling better about ourselves and we have all this technology, then what's, you know, what are we missing here? Uh, I think we're letting technology rule our lives versus using it, you know, for us to create our lives. Yeah. I'm looking down because I wrote some stats before we um, pushed record on this podcast and I was Interesting enough, you know, because I know a lot of your work is in the relationship space as well. And I read that half of Americans in romantic relationships say they deal with their partner being distracted by their phones. 40% of partnered adults say they are bothered by the amount of time their partner spends on their phone. Yeah. And then women are about twice as likely as men to say they are often bothered by the amount of time their partner spends on their phone. Yeah. Yeah. I, it is a big problem. And I see this as a parent, right? Sometimes I'm at watching my son play tennis and my phone vibrates and I'm like, Ooh, might be something important. I pull it out. And then for a split second, I'll see my son, you know, playing tennis and looking over and seeing me on the phone. And of course this has happened since they were born. Right. So it's these little moments where they go, Oh, that's normal. That's one thing, right? It's like, that's what humans do. But two, it's also as they get older, it's like, oh, my dad's paying attention to the phone, but I just did a really nice uh, serve in tennis and he didn't, he missed it, right? But it happened so quickly that I started to be more aware of that recently. And I believe that when you're in a partnership, I have actually a couple that I'm currently coaching. And one of the complaints is from the husband, actually, that the wife spends too much time on the phone because she's a business owner. Uh, her business is 24 seven, right? Because she's selling products online and it's become a real issue. And she's admitted that she often does it because she's bored. She's wants to be distracted. She doesn't want to deal with life um, in the moment. And also because she's a parent of two young children and, you know, their marriage is not, not that going, it's on the rocks right now. So, but she was aware of that. And she said, but I can't stop. Like, I just, I just, it's, it's so habitual, right? And that's the issue that, as we know, all of us can be brainwashed. We can all, you know, start a new, create a new habit out of another one. So it's, we just have to do it ourselves. We have to say, 
stop no more. Even if we need to put the phones into a box that we lock it up during dinner as parents or, you know, some crazy measure until we're used to it, we have to retrain our brain to say like, that's, that's too much, you know, and that's hard. That is truly like a rehab. You know, there, there's a uh, two directions that I'm thinking to take this conversation um, to spin it. The the first direction is around, you know, your work with ADHD and mm-hmm. the distraction and the brain um, being in this constant state of absorbing content and and putting on a high stress and, and it's being stressed because it's now the to-do list doesn't go away. You're just essentially adding something else that is taking up your attention that is, um, um, I guess you're saying stimulating the brain, requiring energetic and attention that then it's hard to then focus on essentially the goals that you have in mind for yourself. And I know the two of us have even, you've read that book, um, Deep Work. Deep Work, yep. Deep Work. And so there's that one direction that I think would be interesting to take this conversation And then the other direction is more of like the controversial one. And I'm bringing up the controversial one because I, I, I have a feeling that you could ride that wave with me around the quote unquote conspiracy theories. Sure. And more um, recently, as I was, you know, having this discussion around social media and giving it up, a friend of mine had sent me uh, an episode of David Icke's decoding the matrix. Mm -hmm. And in this particular episode, David Icke, you know, lays out the whole, this this agenda, David Icke always talks about the agenda and this uh, plan for control and that human beings um, become integrated with technology and he also shared in this episode that, you know, in um, Switzerland, which I, I uh, are Sweden, Switzerland, Switzerland, Switzerland yeah. Yeah. yeah, in Switzerland, that there's already, you know, a group of people that they have in, um, injected these chips into that they when they can open doors because the door knows that it's, you know, the owner of the house because they yep. have this chip inside of them. And so this getting an attachment to our phones is actually part of an overall bigger plan because yeah. our brains will essentially be, you know, the internet, it'll be, will be persuaded by all of this content and information. Yeah. So I'm curious in, and I imagine that you are aware of some of what I'm speaking of, and mm-hmm. if that also was part of your decision process for getting off of social media. Well, I love the topic. I love the question. I'm going to pause the question first and, and just address what you said. Um, I've certainly been aware of, uh, you know, a lot of conspiracy theories during the COVID election time. Um, I never uh, uh, call them... I don't call them conspiracy uh, theories anymore. I saw a really great meme the other day that said, let's call them spoiler alerts. I like Mm. that because a lot of the things that were conspiracy theory back in, you know, 2020 and 21 are now have now become a reality. And I think most people, the ones who would call people like myself and yourself who are doing deep research conspiracy theorists, it's because they're actually still afraid to admit that what we said or they said back in 2020 and 2021 has now become a reality, right? If they would admit to that, they would realize that they were kind of ignorant for a couple of years. And I'm not saying every conspiracy theory became a reality. Maybe it's 50-50, I don't know. But so that said, when I hear what you were talking about and when I've heard David Icke speak around that, I used to look at it as a very dark you know, like there is the bad people that are going to make us do things for their, you know, uh, wealth and power. Sure. I mean, we already know that exists. Anyone denying that there's some really powerful people, you know, doing it for themselves, I mean, is is literally ignorant, right? That that term, they're ignoring the, the facts. 
So that said, I do believe that's just part of human nature, right? You become more powerful. You want power. Why? You said the key word to be in control. Well, control is an illusion because we can't really control things. Um, we can feel like we're in control for a while and then we die. So we didn't have control really. But so getting back to the control part, um, I believe that there are uh, uh, certain people out there who, much like a science fiction movie, who know where it's all heading, right? Elon Musk and all these people. We know that eventually uh, the phone, we w you know, it'll be integrated into the body and connected to the brain. It's the hard drive, the internet, like you said. It's all going there anyway. Like artificial intelligence is is unstoppable. We can't stop it because that's progress of technology. That's just, you know, convenience. We want to have a robot that does things for us, right? Um, or systems that work automatically. So how I uh, came across this is I had a very interesting thought while I was uh, diving deep on ADHD because one of the big, uh, you know, uh, factors to diagnose ADHD, one of the big symptoms is impulsivity. Hmm. And I always thought like, well, I'm a very impulsive person and I've been very successful in life. I often uh, do things so impulsively that people are like, wait, what do you, you haven't even done any research about it. And here's the kicker. I realized that when I've, when I listen to my intuition and it, all, it takes time and, and, and energy and, you know, effort to uh, calibrate our intuition. And I realized, why is my intuition so clear that I can just go and do it and I don't doubt it? And I realized it's because I've been impulsive enough to make mistakes and learn or to be successful and learn through my, right, impulsive actions that now I can trust it. It's like a muscle. And then I thought, wait a minute, artificial intelligence is going to have a hard time replacing impulsive people because they're unpredictable. But it can replace people who have a very predictable life, who, you know, go to work at the same time, who do the research, make, you know, make their actions based on what other people say. It's just a very predictable way of living. So think about any job that's predictable, you can replace quickly with artificial intelligence because it's, re it's repetitive. It's the same patterns, right? But when you're trying to like copy or imitate an impulsive person who you never know what they're going to do next, good luck. You cannot replace that person. So I thought, yay for ADHD people, because they're going to be the last ones to be replaced with artificial intelligence. The first ones to go are what I call the farmers, the drones that are just doing the same boring work every day, who it's not really their passion, right? They don't listen to their impulses. They don't listen to their intuition, which by the way, sorry, I'm rambling, but I'm really passionate about this. One of the other things I realized is that the government or the powers to be or whoever is trying to control people, right? Um, let's just say that's what's happening. You know, really, if you look at it, if you have people who are externally dependent on the news, the feedback, the government, right? They always look to the outside to sort of get a sense of what they should do next. You create dependency that's external. But if you have people, individuals who trust their intuition, right? Who calibrate it, their intuition, who trust their intuition. So they're referenced internally. They're, they're going to be independent because they don't need you or I or the government to tell them what to do next. They listen, they feel it out and they go, okay, I'm going to buy that car. I'm going to be with this person. I'm going to change my job. I'm going to move to this town, right? They're not dependent on outside sources. And so I realized that the way to stay powerful as individuals to not be run by the external power source is to start creating internal uh, power. And that includes, for me, being off of social media because that's an external source that informs me and tells me what to do. So uh, closing the circle, I love the topic. I do believe that there's forces out there uh, uh, trying to control, uh, things, but that's just a natural progression of humanity and technology. To me, that's not an evil thing. I mean, we're all, we were all born little kids at some point and then trauma happened. And then we made up our 
story that now I need to be powerful or I need to show everybody that I'm powerful. So they're just people on a power trip, but they're still human beings trying to figure out how to be happy. So I don't let that weigh me down. I don't see it as, as a dark cloud of the Illuminati and all that stuff. Great. Those are labels. I get it. But I'm not interested in that. That's not part of my life. You know, doesn't mm-hmm. bring me joy. Yeah, there was, there was a really good quote that I saw uh, months ago around spontaneity reality is mm. essentially the uh, kind of like the, 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 it, it is what dilutes or almost makes control impossible. Yes. It's exactly. the way to be free. <laughs> yep. That is absolutely. And of course, I do believe in, I call it scheduled spontaneity, right? Because once you have children and business and there's a, there's a schedule in your life, you can't just spontaneously go through life and do whatever you want at every moment, right? Ideally, that would be very freeing. But let's face it, we live in a Western society with time and schedules. But if we schedule it and we say tomorrow between 8 and 12, I'm going to be spontaneous, right? Even that's a start. That's a way to calibrate and check in like what do I like to do and why do I like to do it is it because I'm supposed to now go do yoga people say you should or do I enjoy it or what else would I want to do right you start to get to know yourself and that's a huge like I mean I'm in that process right now I'm 52 and I'm barely getting to know myself uh, and I'm excited about it it's a really exciting uh, uh, time and I did not have time and energy to practice that when I was on social media. I was just too busy, you know, yeah, always gives, distracted. It gives more time for to, to feel into your own spirit. And yeah, yeah. And you know, sorry to interrupt there, but you just made me think of something and you said controversial earlier. I'm gonna go controversial for a second. Um, one other thing I realized is very personal, but I don't mind sharing it because it was a, a parallel realization is what I realized once I was off of social media, right? I would still have moments of boredom, overwhelm, or not wanting to take responsibility. And I realized what I turned to was porn and masturbation. Mm. And I realized after a while, I was like, oh, I only do that when I'm bored or confront it, right? too much responsibility. Um, and I want to check out. And for me, that was my reality, right? For other people, it could be something different, but I realized that. And the moment I got a, a hold of that and I stopped, um, at some point I was off of porn for a year uh, and masturbation. And again, it was amazing to, to not have, to not have it as a, as a fallback distraction, right? As a numbing out my, uh, uncomfortableness to be with my emotions or whatever it was. So it doesn't matter what it is. Social media is just one of them. Uh, Porn and masturbation is another. Food is another, right? It just depends what you turn to. Mm -hmm. What do you do now instead? Well, I'm I'm back with, with, uh, of course, masturbation. It's human, right? Um, But it's no longer a thing that I just ran, like I just do it because I'm bored. It's become more like a self-pleasure experience. Porn, I still watch once in a while, but not nearly as much as I used to. And so, again, it's moderation. It's realizing why I was doing it when I was doing it, right? That's my, that's kind of my message. It's more like, it's not that you have to give everything up, right? Same with food. You can eat chocolate cake once in a while if you just treat yourself and you really enjoy it. But there's people who eat it every day, right? Because they're numbing part of, of their emotions because they're uncomfortable being with it. I, I know we have to wrap in a moment, but are, just quick question: are, sure. the, Is the porn and the masturbation are they tied together? They don't have to be, but I think uh, a lot of times when you're bored and not so much into the pleasure, you just need something to stimulate you quickly so you can get it over with. That's kind of the that was kind of what it was for me. And porn does that, right? That's why they have porn at uh, the fer- what is it fertility clinics or yeah. sperm doll? No, right? Don't, yeah. How, how come? Because they're like, okay, let's uh, let's get it up and let's go. Yeah. So so for me, um, it, it was just so evident staring me in the face because I no longer had social media. And then after the porn and masturbation realization, I realized food. I was often eating food because I was bored and my kids had snacks and I just joined them in their snacks and they weren't healthy. 
And so I've taken that on now. And so it's like evaluating every area of life to see, is it a distraction? Am I doing it to distract myself or to numb, right? It's a coping mechanism. Or am I choosing to do it powerfully for a good reason? And once I started looking at that, everything in life changed. And and social media was an easy one because I guess I wasn't really ever super into it like some people were. I was into it, but um, so I would just say it's good to start with one as a low, lower hanging fruit where you're like, yeah, I'm not going to really miss it that much. Let's let's kick that habit, right? You know what I hear a lot within how you speak is 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 this journey that you're on is also a journey of discipline and mm-hmm. self commitments or even self boundaries as well. Yeah. And I can't help but think about oftentimes within relationships, when you get into relationships, we want to, you know, everyone's always kind of craving to feel free. We want to feel f- free in everything we do. And here, as I listen to you, I'm like, this is a man who's disciplined um, or is practicing being disciplined, is practicing self boundaries, is practicing commitment. And so even in relationships, oftentimes when we, you know, we think that when we get into relationship that it it's some people think that like it 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 strips you of your freedom. But there's also a way that a relationship, when it is intentionally designed by two people to include boundaries and commitments, and there is some discipline with inside of that relationship, I believe that you can then feel free inside of that. Well, that's that's a whole nother uh, conversation that I'd love to have at some point more around relationships, and you know, I, I have my own opinions on, you know, what freedom is, and 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 women having to feel safe before they can feel free, and men really feeling freedom before they feel free, right? Um, but I will say that I'm at the beginning of it. I'm maybe you know two, three, four years into being a more disciplined person, I'm definitely far away from being super disciplined like some of them. But then again, I think some people get so disciplined that it's it's also an addiction, right? It becomes an OCD kind of like, I got to be there always the same time. I got If I don't work out at this time, I'm, I'm miserable, you know. So you can take it too far on either side. But I think uh, I'm starting to get better at it. I certainly have. My wife is a big inspiration as a role model of of discipline, integrity. Um, I've had other mentors who showed me the value of, of discipline. And I think I'm starting to embrace it more, but I, I've come to it later in life and, and I'm glad because it's a slower process for me because I, I do feel I'm a, I'm a kind of person that uh, I need to take things head on. I'm not an abstinence kind of person. A lot of programs, like a lot of the anonymous programs, work with like, okay, stop doing it, right? And now I get it in a substance, alcohol, drugs, that helps because you're, you're, you're done. You're staying away from that influence, right? But in my life, I've learned that whatever I need to face, uh, whether it's an addiction or a distraction, I'm going to do it head on. I'm going to go in there because I've done enough work in my life that I can trust myself to not get stuck in it. But I go face the dragon and then when I'm done facing it and I realize how destructive it's been in my life, I let it go and I go on to the next one, right? So not everybody can do that. I have friends who definitely cannot do that, but I have friends who can do it and that's who I've learned from. It's like, go see what it's all about. Like s- step into the ring and see what you get from that interaction and then move on and then discipline if needed or let it go, right? Mm. That's kind of been my process. Yeah, try new things. I I could start a whole other conversation right now around um, semen retention, but we'll we'll put a, a pin in that one as well. Yeah, that would be great. I'd love to talk about uh, relationships uh, uh, since you're also working in that space together. We could definitely share notes and and relate about it, right? Yeah. Thank you so much for joining me for this episode. Your podcast, I I did listen to an episode of ADHD is over. And I was fascinated by the discussion. I believe that was with Erica, Dr. Dr. Erica. Uh Dr. Erica Commissar in New York City. Yeah, she's amazing. 
Yeah, that was a a great episode. You had really interesting guests. And I am, you know, not a mother at this moment in time, but I found the conversation really insightful um, for anybody who has children or anybody who wants to move through this sense of feeling distracted in a sometimes overly stimulated environment. Um, I really did appreciate also to um, the thinking of, you know, relaxing the mind um, and how we yeah. create greater environments to do that so we can deeply think. Um, you know, I have a vision or dream to write a script one day, and nice. I don't imagine being able to do that if I am poking around on social media and being distracted by every notification or sounds, you know, that is pulling in for my attention. Yeah. And I will say just as a last thought that, you know, one thing I've learned is this, like life is in the now, right? There's no time. We made it up. It's scientifically proven. And so life happens now and now and now. And our biggest desire is to be present in the now, because if we've ever been in it, it's amazing, right? It's the zone. It's the being present And the only way to be present is when we're not distracted. And the only way not to be distracted is to be present. But when you're trying to lock eyes with someone and there's something dancing here constantly, like left and right, it's literally hard to be, you can still try to do it. Some people can, but I think the goal is to really, to help ourselves is to, to, to put on the the blinders, if you will, or, you know, to remove the distractions from our environment, and then we can be present. And then we can realize how ultimately already taken care we are, how uh, everything is fine in the moment, right? How alive we are when we're present with someone or in an experience. And then we realize, oh, we don't actually need all those distractions. And why are they there? Let me use them to my benefit. Let me not be run by them. And then we can still use pick and choose, right? Mm. So it's not about abstinence. It's not about uh, totally getting rid of every social media type of thing in our lives. It's just figuring out how to, how to uh, customize something that works for us, right? Mm. Amen to that. Where's the best place for listeners to find you? Yeah. So uh, ADHD is over is on all the podcast platforms. And so is You Love Life, or they can just look for Roman Wyden. And I keep a low profile. So usually parents or people interested in being on the show, they uh, they just write to us uh, through the uh, website, which is ADHDisover.com. That's the best way to find me. Amazing. Thank you for this conversation. It's been so nice to reconnect with you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It's always a pleasure because I get to express myself. Uh, I feel lit up right now. I feel inspired. I feel grateful that I had this opportunity. So thank you. Mm, Thank you. And thank you everybody for listening to this episode of Deepen with Christina. If you enjoyed the show, please subscribe, follow, leave a comment, send it to a friend. get them into the discussions. Um, I love that Roman is dancing right now too. (laughs) Um, And go check out the calendar at wedeepen.com. There are some updates coming out that I'm super excited to share. So if you are listening to this after May of 2022, definitely go see what's happening there. And uh, until next time, enjoy. Bye.